Hi there, this is a screencast on monopolistic competition now. Um, let's look at the assumptions, just like as we did before. Um, in particular, there will be a large number of firms in this type of markets um, or industry, but one firm in a particular location. So think of a town and a hairdresser there or an Italian or Turkish restaurant or things like this. They are basically in monopolistic competition with each other. I mean, not, not, I'm, I'm not saying it's competition between a hairdresser and a restaurant, but Italian restaurant competes with the rest of the restaurants in nationwide, but it's just in a particular location, there is always one of this kind. And they try to differentiate products and then uh, try to appeal to sort of niche sort of segment of the market usually. Um, in terms of uh, market shares, these firms usually have small market shares, uh, given that there are large amount of or large numbers of firms. Well, usually there are quite a lot of, of um, restaurants, for example, um, and because of this, they have very small market share. And say other like um, hairdressers, for example, or barbers, their market share is a tiny amount because there are so many of them. Although there could be one or two in a town, usually um, we could drive to other towns because we like their services, yeah? So that, that's an interesting point here that we like them, other other hairdressers. So we, we take, take time and do because go there because maybe they are offering something different from one one in our own town, yeah? So that's one, one imp in a specific characteristic or important characteristic of monopolistic competition, which I'm going to talk in a minute. Okay, so small market shares and uh, firms are independent of each other. In other words, the decision of one firm doesn't affect other firm. Uh, interdependence is something that's uh, usually specific to oligopoly, which we'll cover next week. But there's, let's assume that the, the decision of one firm doesn't affect others' uh, reactions or actions. And it, the entry is free. That implies no cost. Well, in practice, there will be some small cost to just set up a barber shop or a, a mobile phone shop, for example, in a town center. And importantly, products are differentiated. So, in in, in other uh, in perfect competition, for example, we said that it, even if there is a lot of firms there, firms are not able to differentiate. But here, we relax this assumption and we think that firms are able to differentiate by branding, by adding flavor, by tweaking design, and offering something you know extra on top of what the service is provided, how the service is provided, and many other ways, advertising is one thing, developing new products, for example, another thing. This allows these firms, as a result, uh, to, to raise their prices. They are able to charge the price that they want to. This, again, leads to something called downward sloping demand. If you remember, in the perfect competition case, we didn't have a downward sloping demand curve. It was only for market. But in this case, the because it, there is a differentiation and is a firm is able to set its price, it can uh, uh, raise the price in other words yeah so that leads to a downward sloping demand curve so higher prices means lower demand lower price means higher demand so we need that assumption of downward sloping demand however because there will be a lot of other different uh, products similar products not different I should say from different companies or other companies that's competing with this company say uh, the slope uh, sorry the downward sloping demands elasticity is important here again so Demand elasticity basically determines how much profit it makes in the short run as well, which we're going to talk next as well. But elasticity itself depends on the degree of product differentiation. And product differentiation depends on how much uh, effort it puts into a firm, it puts into developing new product or advertising. So these are brief uh, um, summary of uh, what you're going to look at in the next few slides. Okay, let's move on then. Uh, equilibrium of the firm, equilibrium of the monopolistically competing firm in the industry. In the short run, as usual, we start with the short runs. Uh, equilibrium output is determined uh, at the point where margin cost equals margin revenue. That's basically the optimal point or a profit maximizing point. A level of supernormal profits exists, some degree of supernormal profit exists, but it depends on the demand curve and also its position, elasticity of demand curve, and let's see how it does that. Um, as usual, we have average revenue determined by the demand curve and its curvature, or I should say the gradient in this case, and margin revenue is given in red line. Usually, AC curve uh, is U-shaped, and MC curve just crosses the bottom of the AC. 
and the profit maximizing units IQS at the point where MC equals MR and the price is determined by tracing out upwards this uh, from this point onward so that's PS so that's PS is the profit maximizing uh, price of, for this firm now imagine that we, we if you remember we, t we said in the last slide that the um, super normal profits exist that really depends on the uh, the shape of the demand curve and its position not shape the, the position and the elasticity of it so let's look at, at as, uh, its uh, its profits as it is as, as it is given now i mean the demand curve so we can look at the scenario a bit later now if you remember the profit per unit is the difference between uh, the price so that's ps and then the uh, average curve here, yeah, average cost, sorry. So that's that, average cost for so, uh, short run, that stands for short run. And that is the profit area. The shaded area is the profit, total profit. So you have the, the quantity here, so that quantity QS times the per unit qu quantity. That shaded area is then the super normal profit. Oops, I just didn't want to do that. Now, if, uh, if the, uh, if the demand curve is positioned relative, uh, further to the right relative to AC, you could see that the profits, uh, this uh, the profit area increases. For example, yeah, it increases. For example, if if it's positioned right there, it starts from there, and it, uh, the, the the demand curve is a bit inelastic. Then you could see that the profit uh, size of the supernormal profit might increase. Yeah, so that's that's the point here that we mentioned. If you go back. Uh, oops, don't want to go back now. Anyway, in the previous slide, we mentioned that the place position elasticity of the demand curve. So um, it determines how uh, how much supernormal profit the firm makes. It it can make a firms can in general make few supernormal profits if the degree of differentiation is high and is able the firms are able to uh, persuade or convince the people that their products are more superior than others or. Imagine that guy who wants to eat that specific, you know, kebab shop. You tell yourself, okay, this is, for example, you went to a kebab shop and they say, oh, this is the best Turkish kebab I've ever eaten. So I will always come there and buy them. That's, that's normal because these uh, this, this uh, firms usually differentiate their products and then that basically attracts a lot of customers. So that allows them to raise the prices. So next, say, the prices has risen. Prices have risen, so to say, some, somewhere here. But then obviously it affects the demand as well. It will be, there will be a bit of a bit less demand. However, if the demand curve is inelastic relatively, it's, in other words, its gradient is uh, steeper. In that case, you could expect that the the, uh, the increase in price will not actually have a much effect in terms of um, lost lost profits. People will still buy. For example, I'm addicted to Subway. Uh, here in Milan and Stepney Green, they rose the prices uh, last year, but I'm still buying it because they are good. I like them uh, uh, compared to the other shops next to. I mean, um, in the in the area, like the uh, I think there are other uh, takeaways and things like that. But I like the uh, the sub um, subway product because they dif do differentiate and sometimes they do promotions. The flavor is good. It's cleaner as well. So they do differentiate. You see, they have these gloves. They put on the gloves every time they want to. You know, if you order something, they just uh, are more hygienic in other words, yeah? Okay, that's an example of product differentiation here. In this case, service differentiation, obviously. Now, in the long run, however, because there exists this amount of profit potential or the supernormal profit potential, a lot of firms enter the industry, yeah? That implies the supernormal profits are competed away. So other firms entering the firm because freedom of entry implies anyone can just set up another another uh, restaurant next to it or, or take away next to Subway and start competing. In that case, what happened is that uh, we look at the uh, long run average cost curve. Um, that's a bit uh, widened up a version of average cost curve for short run. As you can see, it's quite wide and our long run marginal cost curve just cut through this middle as well again and because of a lot of uh, customers sort of firms entering the market i'm saying a lot it's just reasonably a lot of firms entering now because of the existence of supernormal profits the long run co uh, demand curve of this individual uh, monopolistically competitive firm is shift to the left you can see that the arrows are pointing towards the left and you see different from the other slides 
the demand curve is now uh, flatter. It becomes more elastic because now slight change in price is now moving customers to elsewhere. So to other competitors now entering means their demand curve becomes more elastic. Slight rise in price leads to loss of customers. Now, most specific case, the more important thing here is this uh, point, this point here. You can see that the long run price is now at the point where uh, is determined by looking at the point where margin revenue equals margin cost curve, but then it's determined at the point where the long run, uh, sorry, this demand curve is just kissing the bottom side up side bottom of the long run average cost curve that implies price is just covering the average costs yeah the price is just covering the average costs. that's because in the long run a lot of firms coming in and taking large chunks of market share between themselves and and splitting it basically and then reducing the profits so that's ql and pl okay that's done and in the long run however the firms do not utilize their full capacity oh, Firms do not utilize their full capacity. That's because look at this now. The uh, they they operate not at the bottom, not at the bottom. They could, if they wanted, they could they could pro provide at this point. But notice that this is not optimal for them. They could would rather have the uh, uh, would rather have the uh, the operate at PL, and that's also the point where they just cover the uh, costs because if they want to operate right right here by uh, moving to the point here, the cost curves are basically uh, positioned at, at a bit higher price than the, pri uh, the price that the demand curve commands. So they cannot operate here at this point by providing more. So it leads to this uh, case of uh, underutilization of capacity. And I'll, I'll talk about a bit more about this in a minute. If we move on, uh, there is... Uh, there's a case where we can compare this with uh, perfect competition. In perfect competition, if you remember, the the, the uh, AR curve, this AR line would be flat and just kisses the bottom of this line, of this average long run average cost. That will be the, the full full um, uh, full utilization of capacity. Yeah? And there is always scope for uh, lowering the costs if a monopolistic competition firm wants to do it. But it turns out that if it increases the output, the price should go down much below than the average cost. That implies it will leave the market. So it cannot, in the under monopolistic competition, it cannot do that. So it just operates somewhere close to the minimum efficient point, which is this lowest cost point but above it obviously, yeah? above it, to the left of it. So that means there is an underutilization of capacity. Now, a quick question. As new firms enter monopolistically competitive industry, the demand curve facing each existing firm, now take 10 seconds. Yep, you may have now by now noticed it or answered the question. Yes, that's A. Uh, we've just talked about it. More firms entering the market implies, uh, well, substitutes, more close substitutes. So it becomes more elastic and and then uh, shifts to the left. You know, other, other firms now are biting into the market uh, share of this existing firm now. Now, the, the thing that I just talked about, uh, let's compare, we usually use the uh, perfect competition as a, as, an, as a theoretical extreme, remember? It's a benchmark for us, which I mentioned earlier. Now, we compare this more realistic monopolistic competition case with the case of perfect competition and then see which one is better. Now, oops, let's go, let's have a look at this case now. It's it's made slightly different, it's drawn slightly different, it's it's moving further to the left of the main the minimum efficient scale here. Just to make it a bit more clear, it's not to exaggerate, but to make it a bit clear to you. Notice that in the long run, as we said, the demand curve just kisses the sort of side bottom of the uh, long run average curve. And the, at this point, um, the price uh, at which the firm, the existing firm, sells its goods is just covering their average cost in the long run. Yeah, and that's the quantity they produce. However, 
Andy, uh, perfect competition. Remember, if the market is populated by perfectly competitive firms, let's say if you have loads of barbers in the same town, let's say 10 barbers, what do you expect? The prices to go down, of course. So the prices go down to a point where, again, uh, there will be no supernormal profits. But in this case, the firms operate at a lower cost, most efficient point. And quantity as well so that q2 here is so this firm would produce more compared to the monopolistically competitive firm that means you would cut more hairs as well as you could offer expand your services by offering more um, uh, per, per hour or your productivity increases apparently as a firm then at this point because then customers going to other towns will then come back to you as well so under perfect competition the the quantity offered is higher at a lower cost. Again, it, it tells, tells us that perfect competition, comp competitive markets is more are more superior than the monopolistically competitive firms. Now, um, let's have a look at a quick question here that keeps you alive. Say, a monopolistically competitive industry in the long run will experience excess capacity that we just looked at. To which one of the following is this due? Take 10 seconds again or more if you want. It looks like quite a lengthy one. Yep, as you said, it's D. It's the tendency point of the firms AR and LR, LRAC curves is to the left of the minimum LRAC, which we just discussed in the previous slide. Okay, few points before we uh, wrap up here. Um, other than this uh, equilibrium, short run and long run equilibrium comp uh, point, uh, competition or the price determination, quantity and price determination points, we have to look at the way firms operate as well. Uh, demand curve really depends on product development or differentiation. That also depends on how much uh, the firm invests in developing a product. In other words, research and development, research and development, for example, you could think of all investments. And the firms usually try to make their demand curves elastic, more less elastic, I should say, which means inelastic in, in other sense, in other case, in, in other words, and uh, inelastically demanded goods usually are sold more in quantities regardless of the prices, for example, yeah? So the, the firm, in, to, keep, to keep the monopolistic position in this small town of its goods, it should keep improving, it should keep improving the products that they sell. So they need to come up with new products, maybe, maybe improve the flavor, for example, for restaurant, or sell something at discount for a petrol station for example next in addition to say uh, uh, petrol you know, they, in fact if you go to petrol stations you always see a grocery store or some other news agents sitting up stores there that's a kind of pro differentiation that they make and advertising for example um, is another way of improving uh, uh, demand curve or making the demand curve more inelastic the purpose of advertising is usually obviously to persuade customers or convince them that your product is better than the others and that implies if customers con are convinced or believe in that advertising usually they keep buying from that firm and that implies again uh, demand curve becomes less elastic so these two points are important when it comes to uh, short run equilibrium point. Remember, the supernormal profits really depend on uh, the position and the elasticity of the uh, demand curve. And that demand curve itself depends on how uh, the firm behaves in this case, how it invests, and things like this. So, when you compare monopolistic competition with perfect competition, and also we'll, we'll also look at monopoly case, we know that with the perfect competition case, we saw excess capacity because the firm, monopolistically competitive firm, operates to the left of the minimum cost point. That implies less production, fewer produ units, and then higher price. And obviously, they are not selling at a low cost, so it's not a productively efficient now point. And now, uh, comparing with monopoly, however, um, well, given that there are many firms, the prices are usually lower for uh, for uh, for monopolistically competitive firms, 
because monopoly usually charges higher higher products and prices and their demand uh, curve is quite elastic demand is quite elastic for their products inelastic i should say you could you remember from the last graph um last 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 video on monopoly you will see that the demand curve is usually steeper and with the monopolistic competition however you have little economies of scale opportunities basically because there are many firms competing uh, the scope for being, being bigger or producing more is limited to what you could sell as a differentiated product you know you always have this sort of segment of customers buying from you not not mass population you know masses of people buying it so it's it's very hard then in that case to uh, invest in uh, research and development as well because economies of scale would allow a firm to save for investment into Mondomi products so there's a constraint in that case as well okay so that's monopolistic competition and uh, next one would be oligopoly which 